Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. Good evening and welcome. You're watching Africa Prime. I'm Godfrey Mutizwa. Now, the Public Investment Corporation has been around for a hundred years. In fact, it celebrated its centenary on the 2nd of May in 2011. It manages over a trillion rand in assets. The majority of those funds are for government employees. Tonight, we talk to the Chief Executive Officer of the PIC and uh, we talk about the transformation that the PIC has undergone over the years. And to give us that more insight, as I said, it's uh, Mr. Elias Masilela, CEO of uh, the PIC. Let's begin first, and I want to indulge you, and begin first by talking about your uh, pet uh, like, which is retirement funding. Why is it important in the South African context to get retirement funding right and retirement reform correct? It is important for a number of reasons. Firstly is because, to a large extent, South Africa has what can be termed as a porous social security network. Secondly, it is because in the South African context, not every South African can enjoy a job. And that means social security and retirement reform becomes an important part of the economy. With respect to the retirement component, the likelihood is that the average South African is going to retire with only 30% of the salary that they earn during their productive years which means their welfare will have to decline or drop by 70%. So the need to force this restructuring is to encourage people to save more for their retirement so that they are not a burden on the state or they are not dependent on the state for the livelihood when they get to retirement. Yeah. But that problem is not only a problem only at retirement stage. It's a problem now. And it's a problem now because of high dependency ratios in South Africa. One of the contributors to the high dependency ratios is the high level of unemployment, right. where many of South Africans will go through a lifetime not having enjoyed a productive employment arrangement. And that means they, re they rely on family or they rely on the state for their sustenance. So part of the intervention on, on, on the reform is to ensure that the economy changes and raises its ability to absorb more labor units, that is generate more jobs, in order to make sure that people in their productive years live well, as well as living well in their retirement. You do want people to be actively involved in providing for their future. That's, that's the underlying principle of the reform. It's not to encourage handouts, but it's to encourage higher le levels or higher rates of employment during productive years. And this is why one of the key factors in the restructuring is also restructuring the macroeconomy so that it can be able to generate those opportunities for more jobs. And that is underpinned, has to be underpinned by growth. Yeah. But in, it, it is also clear that there will be people who will not enjoy a job like people who cannot look after themselves, who are uh, disabled. There the state has to come in and assist. With the scourge of HIV and AIDS, what we've also seen is that the rate of increase of uh, orphans that don't have anybody to look after them basically means the state needs to intervene. And the state cannot turn the other way and hope that such imbalances will resolve themselves. Now, the PIC runs the defined benefit uh, model, and uh, it is a model that, as we were discussing earlier on before we came onto the program, that you say stood it in very good state during the financial crisis of 2008. And yet, it does have its drawbacks. Are there any plans to relook this and perhaps get people to contribute rather than expect that uh, uh, the, the, the pension that they get on their final salary is going to be it and they are sitting cushy? Um. I'm not sure how qualified I am to comment on that, simply because the structure of the benefits in the GPF are a function of a discussion between employer and employee, sure. GPF and the employer or government in this case. Yeah, but you However, as the professional manager, you would have an opinion, I imagine. <laughs> Yes, I, I do have an opinion. This is why I have to qualify first before I say something about it. 
Sure. And the opinion here is whether or not a DB arrangement is appropriate for South Africa. My immediate response is yes, it is appropriate. And the reason for that is because of the level of literacy that we experience or enjoy in South Africa. What we have seen amongst OECD countries as a result of the financial crisis, yeah. where a lot of the DB funds collapsed significantly, which caused employers and governments to conclude that they can no longer meet the obligations or the, 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 the promises that they've made to, to, to their employees. They've decided to force people from a DB arrangement to a DC arrangement. That's the defined what, contribution. That's a defined contribution arrangement. What that basically means is that it shifts the burden of the investment risk from the employer to the employee, the individual in this case. Now, in a, an environment where literacy is high enough, you can take that risk. But in an environment where the literacy is low, that risk is not sound to take because effectively what you're saying is you are giving people who do not have an ability to make investment decisions to be making investment decisions on their long term. But returns. the question also remains, can we afford it? Particularly given these, that South Africa is a developmental state and there are many competing demands for funding. Uh, affordability is a function of a number of variables. In a DB arrangement, the asset liability matching is critical in everything that you do. Now, that is driven by two sides of the equation. On the one side is the asset performance side, which the PIC is responsible for. We get given targets in terms of uh, uh, investment performance. Right. If you meet your performance on that side and nothing happens on the liability side, then you're home and dry. But there's another implication, depending on what happens on the liability side. As the employer increases the number of employees, as the employees pose a lot of or high wage demands on the employer, that increases the liability side. And if the liability side rises faster than the asset side, you are going to end up with a lopsided situation where the employer now ceases to be comfortable with its ability to meet uh, the promises. So given the difficulties that we've seen in Europe that you've just described, shouldn't there be important lessons, particularly for countries like South Africa that are developing, in terms of the right model? Because clearly, these are countries with very, very large purses that have gotten into trouble because of the difficulties in their markets. Um, I wouldn't say there's a right model, but I would say there are certain specific conditionalities that are important. One of the conditionality is uh, financial literacy. We will recall that we're in this crisis today because of poor financial literacy in the richest economy of the world, the US. And that means we need to be very careful how we deal with the way in which we engage with the financial markets and the way in which we engage with uh, our uh, people who manage our funds. The second thing that is important in defining the model is making sure that you are able to fund appropriately and take a long-term view in the way in which you fund your retirement fund. Right. It is not uh, a secret that not long ago, about a decade or two ago, the GPF was underfunded by as much as 30 to 40%. But because of the way in which the GPF restructured itself and the way in which the PRC has been investing over these past few years, we've been able to increase the fundedness to close to 100%. Even at the height of the crisis, the GPF remained one of, if not the only uh, DB fund in the world that remained very close to full fundedness. And that is basically because of the way in which the two ins institutions have been structured. And the two institutions have been seen as a uh, unique case study for the rest of the world. Absolutely. You have a heavy burden. I mean, you manage a trillion rand. It boggles my mind. How do you manage a trillion rand? Um, I don't think about the zeros. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said it is not about the number. It is more about what you do with that number. And for me, the biggest challenge for the PIC is managing expectations. Right. 
Yes, when people think of a trillion rands, they think that the PIC can invest the country out of trouble. That is far from the truth. Simply because we work through, we work through mandates, we don't make independent decisions. We do make tactical decisions, sure. but the strategy is determined elsewhere. I was actually going to say, break it down for me. So where is this money invested? The money is invested in different pockets. Right. On the one side, we invest in the listed space or on the JSE if you want. What percentage is that? It's about 45%, okay. right? Does the it get higher, does it drop? It, it, it fluctuates, but over a long period of time, uh, the PIC has been uh, skewed towards holding more of bonds than investing in the listed space. But over time, that has shifted with uh, the listed space being carrying a bigger weight than bonds. Where we sit now, bonds are sitting in the region of 30-35%. Okay. Um, and then we invest in property. And then we have investments uh, which is in what we call EC Buyer Fund, which was set up predominantly to invest in developmental areas. And with the latest uh, extension of our mandate, we can now invest offshore. 10% of assets under management will be invested in the rest of the world, half of which will be invested on the, con the rest of the continent, and the other 50% in, in, in the rest of the world outside of the continent. Right. But I think from a de developmental perspective, it is important to identify the approach with which we do that. Right. We have a, a four-pillar system which identify critical areas in South Africa which are important for us. The first pillar is economic infrastructure, right. investing to undo uh, the imbalances that we see on, in, in that part of the economy. How big is that chunk? Um, the, the allocation for the total amount is 5% of assets under management. And the allocation across the pillars hasn't been finalized, but the likelihood is it's going to be an equi, uh distribution of the resources across the pillars. The second pillar is social, sec so, sorry, not social security, social infrastructure. And the third pillar is going to be investing in the green economy, investing in things such as uh, uh, renewable energy. And the way in which we invest in other areas of the economy, we make sure that they complement the objectives of a green economy. And then lastly, we invest in the development of small and medium enterprise development. Elias, we have to take a break now, but when we come back, we'll try and break that down. And also, I want to try and understand how you decide which fund manager uh, gets what chunk of your money. And also, I want to bring into the equation the whole issue around transformation and the role that the uh, PIC plays given the size of the holdings that it has on the JSC. That will come after the break. Do stay with us.